Good morning. Thank you for that prayer, Steve. You know, I'm glad that I wasn't asked to speak back when there wasn't anybody in the sanctuary. That would have been really hard. But I want you to know every time that I speak about the last song of the set, my heart starts beating a little faster and even faster when it's the prayer. So say a prayer for me this morning. Then I'll be able to speak with the power that's in this message that I'm going to share with you this morning. How many of you find yourself in conversations where you want to transition to a spiritual nature and it seems like the door is open but you just don't know how to do it and you're so afraid that you won't do it right? You know, we used to have a pastor in Florida that was a master of inserting Jesus into any conversation. It didn't matter if you were talking, if he was getting his hair cut, if you were just having a brief conversation with him, but he would seamlessly insert Jesus into that conversation. I've never been able to achieve that. But not long ago, I was listening to a presentation by a young man by the name of David Asherick, and he gave some guidelines and principles that really made sense to me I would have loved to have played his video here this morning so he could just say it himself. But unfortunately, it was an hour long. And I don't know that you'd want to sit here for another hour. So I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version this morning of what he shared. David shared some practical tools that we can use to be effective witnesses. How to talk to anyone about Jesus. This is not a how-to. When they say A, you say B. When they say C, you say D, and then they're baptized. It doesn't work that way, does it? I'm going to share some tools that we can find helpful in sharing Jesus in an appropriate way right in the center of conversations that we have every day. First, we're going to look at some biblical background for the why and how that we should engage people who are not where we are in our faith journey. There are a number of passages in Scripture which are guiding passages. The first one is found in Matthew 4, verses 18 to 20. Fishers of men. When Jesus was walking on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he invited Peter, James, and John with these words, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. That's unusual language. That is purposeful use of the language of fishing. Why is Jesus using the language of fishing? Why is he saying, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men? What's the obvious answer? He is talking to fishermen, and so he's using the language of fishing. He's speaking in a fisherman context. He taps into something that they're already familiar with. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. A little bit later in Matthew, chapter 8, in verses 5 to 11, we find Jesus' encounter with the Roman centurion. This is a particularly fascinating situation because the centurion is not a Jew and would certainly have been on the fringes of Jewish society. There would have been many reasons for a Jew to regard him with suspicion and even hatred. But this Roman centurion comes to Jesus and says, I have a servant at home who's very sick. Please speak the word and my servant will be made well. Jesus offers to go to the man's house. But he says, no, no, you don't have to do that. You're a man of authority like me. I tell people to go and they go. I tell people to come, and they come. So just say the word, and my servant will be healed. Jesus turned to those that were traveling with him and said, I have not found so great a faith, not in Israel. Then Jesus speaks the language of authority to the Roman centurion, who who is himself a man of authority. Jesus said, go your way, your servant is healed. Jesus enters into the world of the Roman centurion and affirms his faith, immediately building a bridge. A little bit later in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, 
Jesus encounters a young man, a rich young ruler, who comes to him. There's a series of questions. The young man says, good master, what must I do to be saved? When Jesus makes the invitation to the rich young ruler, listen carefully to what he says. He says, follow me and you will have treasure in heaven. Now let's just analyze that from this very same perspective. He speaks the language of fishing to fishermen. He speaks the language of authority to the Roman centurion. And here, when he's speaking to a wealthy man, to an investor, he says, you're making a good investment if you follow me. He speaks the language of investment. He speaks the language of money. Now, let's turn to Acts, where we will find this very same M.O. in the life of Paul. In Acts 17, we find Paul on Mars Hill speaking to the men of Athens. Listen to how many bridges Paul attempts to build. He says things like this. Men of Athens, I perceive that you are very religious. I was walking in your city and found one of your statues to the unknown God. I am bringing you a message from that unknown God. He continued, as one of your poets has said, we are his offspring. Paul also said things like, God has made of one blood all nations that dwell on the earth, and he is not far from any of us. There are no less than seven purposeful bridges that Paul uses to bring to the Athenians to build bridges to the Athenians. He's quoting their poets. He's using their statues. He is affirming their religiosity. He is trying to build bridges, not walls. Let me read you Paul's M.O., how he conducted himself conversationally and contextually with those who were not members of his faith. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 how his mind works evangelistically. In 1 Corinthians 9, beginning with chapter 19, we read, For though I am free from all men, I've made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. What does he mean that he is free from all men? He was saying, I'm not bound by culture, I'm not bound by nationality, to any one group of people. I make myself free from all, but then he says, I indebt myself to anybody. Why would he do that? Why would he be chameleon-like in his adaptation to other situations and circumstances? He tells us in verse 19, so that I can win them, so that I can have influence on them for the gospel. What is Paul saying here? He says, I am not only willing I am looking for opportunities to adapt myself to the local situation, the local culture, the local conversation so that I can build bridges. So these are our guiding passages that get us heading in the right direction this morning. We can draw several simple conclusions from these passages. Jesus and Paul met people where they are, not where they aren't. They spoke the language. They entered into the world of those they were ministering to. Now, because most of us gathered here this morning and most of those looking online virtually are Seventh-day Adventists, I want to give you several historical quotations for how one of the early founders of the Seventh-day Adventist church, Ellen White, viewed how Seventh-day Adventists, who are a little peculiar, a little strange in some of their doctrinal beliefs and their practices, how Seventh-day Adventists should relate to those who don't share our peculiarities or our beliefs. Listen to what she says. Am I pointing it in the right direction? There we go. In regard to making known our faith, no decided effort should be made to conceal it. We don't hide it. We don't conceal it. Just as Paul did not hide who he was, but interacted with wisdom. 
No unwise effort should be made to conceal our faith, but no unwise efforts should be made, put forth to make it prominent either. What a balance. Don't hide it, but don't put it out front in an obnoxious way. She continues. Do I not press hard enough? <laughs> Persons will come to the sanitarium who are in a favorable condition to be impressed by the truth. If they ask questions, if they ask questions, notice where the initiative starts. It starts on their end and not on ours. If they ask questions regarding our faith, it would be proper to state what we believe in a clear, simple manner. Would you repeat those underlined words with me? In a clear, simple manner. You know, indwelling godliness imparts a power to the conduct of the true believer that gives him or her an influence for the right. You don't have to have or give a giant theological disquisition because the Holy Spirit dwelling inside you will make your clear, simple answer very persuasive. Isn't that neat? The Holy Spirit's going to draw it to their hearts. You just give a simple answer and he'll do the rest. But she goes on. Can somebody flip to the next one? Is that possible? There you go. But in this matter, we should act with discretion. There are conscientious persons who think it's their duty to talk freely upon points of faith on which there's a difference of opinion. In a manner which arouses the combativeness of those with whom they converse. We all know people who think, we've got to tell the truth and we've got to give it to them straight. But notice what she says. When we unnecessarily arouse the combativeness of people, they turn off their ears and then it becomes an argument. When Paul went to Athens, he could have given a very different kind of speech. Instead of saying, I was walking among your statues, and I saw one to the unknown God. I want to talk to you about your own poets, and that you all are very religious. Instead of saying that, he could have said, you're a bunch of polytheistic pagans who don't understand that idolatry is a grave sin against yourself and against the true God, Yahweh. He could have done that, and he would have been telling the truth. But he would have been telling the truth in such a way as to absolutely seal off any hope of being heard. And furthermore, he would have aroused the combativeness of his audience. One such premature, injudicious effort may close the ears of one who otherwise who would have heard patiently but who now will influence others unfavorably. Through the indiscretion of one, the ears and hearts of many may be closed to the truth. So we not only have the example of Jesus and Paul, but here we have one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church saying, be careful how you register the most potentially combative or unusual teachings of your faith those idiosyncratic, peculiar things. Be careful how you register them. When we're driven by the desire to positively influence somebody toward Jesus, we'll be not, not be making a big deal about what Ellen White calls little differences. We're not compromising the truth in any particular when we tell the truth in a way that's wise. We're talking about our timing, about using words that make sense to the people we're talking to, and always keeping our focus on the main thing, and that's Jesus. Before we get to the stories, I need to introduce you to something that David has formulated that he calls the X to 10 fallacy. Just imagine that you have the numbers 1 to 10 on a continuum where one is no religiosity at all. People over here at one may even be hostile to religion. And over here at 10, you have a baptized, spirit-filled, church-attending follower of Jesus. 
everybody you meet is going to be somewhere on that continuum. Let's say you meet somebody who was raised a Christian, but now they've married somebody who isn't a Christian. They're not going to church. They think Jesus is pretty cool, but Christianity does not form a major part of their life. Maybe there are three. Or perhaps you meet somebody who is a devout follower of the Islamic faith. So that they're very religious, but they're certainly not religious in terms of Christianity. Maybe they fit somewhere on a, as a six or a seven because they're very religious. They're very devout. But the Christian thing is a bit of a non-starter for them. Maybe you meet somebody who loves Jesus and occasionally comes to church, but is not sure about certain aspects. Maybe they're a nine, almost ready to come across. The X to 10 fallacy is the idea that you've not really had gospel success until somebody is baptized. No, no. There can be all kinds of wonderful little gospel successes all the way along as we move people toward number 10, a step at a time. Most of our conversion was a little bit here, a little bit there. Any progress toward Jesus, any progress toward God is gospel success. We can trust God with those little less measurable metrics of gospel success. The question should always be, how can I positively influence this person for the gospel? How can I make a favorable impression upon them for Christ? How do we build bridges and not just walls? Here are some stories, some examples of how this works. Shortly after David's arrival in Australia, at the church that he pastored there, he was hounded by one of his members. You've got to come to my local school. I've been telling my chaplain all about you. She was not only hounding David on this end, but she was hounding the chaplain on the other end, as he found out later. We have the greatest pastor. He's so wonderful. You just have to have him come and speak. It eventually works out that David and Ben meet. Over the course of about eight months, they develop a relationship. So Ben comes to David one day and he says, Hey, can I ask you a question? I've done a little research on you Adventist people, and you seem like you're gospel believers, but you got some weird stuff. I love the way you teach. I love the way you preach. I love the connection you have with the students and that they really connect with you. Can I be really open and honest with you? David says, sure, sure, what is it? And Ben says, I've got to ask you about this thing that you don't go to heaven when you die. This is an opportunity for David to set him straight biblically. Or it's an opportunity to build a bridge. David was dealing with someone who already was a follower of Jesus, who loved God, somebody that he viewed as an ally, who's in a secular context, in a secular country, trying to make an impact on young people for the gospel. So it wasn't the time to build a wall. What do you think David was going to build? A bridge. So he said to Ben, I'm so glad that you felt comfortable enough with our relationship to ask me straight out what I believe. Let me just put your mind at ease. What you and I believe is experientially identical. So Ben replied, explain that to me. David said, well, let me just give you an illustration. If something were to happen to me on the way home and I was killed in an accident, what do you believe scripture teaches would be the next thing that I would know? What would be my next conscious thought? Ben said, you'd see Jesus in glory. And David said, that's what I believe. The only difference is I believe there's a period of sleep that the Bible calls the state of sleep between my death and when I have that experience. You think it happens right away. I think it happens at the resurrection, but experientially, you and I believe the same thing. Do you know what Ben said? Man, that really makes sense. That's a bridge. 
David could easily have given a bulleted Bible study that would prove his view to be true, the truth. But rather than peppering him with what he regards as biblical truth, he used it as an opportunity to continue to build bridges. And somebody with somebody that he registered as also a follower of Jesus. So, the first tool in our toolbox. When you are dealing with those who love Jesus and who take Scripture seriously as God's Word, maximize similarity with them. Don't build walls when bridges will do. Here's why. In religious conversations, whether it's with a Muslim or a Baptist or a Catholic or even an atheist, the walls are already there. So rather than build more walls, seek to build bridges. How do you build a gospel bridge? David could have talked about the differences. He could have talked about why he thinks Ben's view is wrong and his view is correct. And there is a time and place for that. But that wasn't the time or the place. So many times in witnessing, it's not really witnessing at all. It's actually just closing doors on people, closing doors on relationships, and making sure that nobody ever asks us about our faith again or what we believe. At the end of the day, you always want to leave people feeling positive about the interaction they have had with you if it's been of a religious nature. Here's an experience that David had with Jehovah's Witnesses. David's own personal conversion to Christ actually began in part with Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on his door. After he was converted and became a pastor, he was out with a church member interviewing people for the church's annual Christmas program, asking people, what does Christmas mean to you? They came up to a group of Jehovah's Witnesses that were there passing out tracts. They already knew the answer they'd get from them. But it seemed socially awkward to ask everybody else around them and to ignore this group. So David extended the invitation and said, Hey guys, could we interview you for our local church program on what does Christmas mean to you? And they said, Absolutely not. They responded that Christmas is a pagan holiday. They went right into Christmas this and Christmas that. But before they could get going too fast, this is what David said. I just want to let you guys know that I am so thankful personally for the work of Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> They're astonished. They don't get that very often, as you can imagine. He continues that it was through the visit of two young men who were Jehovah's Witnesses that he was first introduced to Jesus when he was 22 years old. He shares that they answered questions that he had. They were helpful, respectful, kind, and compassionate. He said, I'm just so thankful that those two young men came to my door because they would got a purple-haired, largely atheistic, punk rocker thinking about Jesus. We understand if you don't want to answer our survey. Have a great day. They don't know what to do. Even when people come to us with combativeness or hostility and they want to get into a theological machine gun fight, we can cut it off and insofar as is possible, speak with affirmation and with approval. So here's the second tool in our toolbox. Not only maximize similarity, but affirm and appreciate others so that you can disarm potential hostility or combativeness affirm and appreciate. An Indian friend, Akil, invited David to come to share an Indian meal when he and, with he and his mother after he found out that David's favorite food was Indian food. Akil was anxious to have his mother meet David as Akil had converted to Christianity from Hindu and his mother was having a difficult time accepting that. She saw positive changes that in her son's life that she was really pleased about. But she was a little nervous, as most of us would be if we raised our child in one religious tradition and they skipped to another. So they had the meal together. After they had visited for a while, the conversation turned to spiritual matters. Now David assumed that this mother probably held him responsible 
for the decision that her son had made, at least in helping to solidify his conversion to Christianity. She was a lecturer at Sydney University, so was no dummy. She had some questions. She was coming with a totally different perspective. In his conversation, David preempted the religious conversation by saying, Suparna, I would love to better understand what Hinduism is for you, what it means to you. Can you help me better understand what you believe? She proceeded over the next half hour to tell him about her own personal journey in Hinduism, the things that she'd really appreciated. She also found, shared some things that she found personally frustrating. Now David was not playing the role of informer, the one doing the talking, but he was playing the one of listening. In the course of that conversation, when it became situationally appropriate, he said, Saparna, can I ask you a question? As a follower of the Hindu faith, what do you see as the primary problem facing the world today? And what is the solution from a Hindu point of view? Ah, she said, and began sharing. So here's another tool for our toolbox. Use the primary problem, primary solution tool to better understand an unfamiliar worldview. It works with every worldview. If you're talking to an atheist, you can say, from an atheistic perspective, what do you view as the primary problem facing humanity today? And what do you see as its solution? If you're talking to a Muslim, you can say, what do you see as the primary problem and primary solution? It works with any group. And what happens is that now you get an open, really open, honest, give and take conversation with somebody where you're doing a lot of learning and a lot of listening. In the course of their conversation, Suparna shared some really positive changes that she had seen in her son, Akil. So, again, when it was a conversationally appropriate, which was about an hour and a half into the conversation, David said, Saparna, can you tell me what you know about Jesus and about Christianity? Help me to understand your own experience with Christianity. And so she responded. At the end of that conversation, they had had such rapport and such a connection because they had talked about all things life is about religion, and children, and marriage, and life, and international moves. It was very obvious, obvious to David that the time was appropriate for him when he was leaving to say, Saparna, before we go, can I pray with you? What do you think she said? Of course. Now, was she baptized at the end? No. But this is how that conversation ended. She said, listen, David, if I ever get word that you and your wife were in Sydney and I don't hear about it and you're not staying in my house and eating my food, I will be personally offended. So did he build a bridge or a wall? A bridge so much so that she invited him to stay at her house, sleep in one of her beds, eat her food. That's success. That's gospel success. Because here a follower of Jesus has had a positive interaction with somebody of another faith tradition. And they have been positively, favorably impressed, not only with David, but with the gospel. All right, another tool for our toolbox. Be comfortable not knowing everything. Admit your ignorance. And don't pigeonhole people. Several times in his conversation with Suparna, he had to say, You'll have to forgive me, but I'm not super familiar with what Hindus believe about. Or, I've read parts of your holy book, and I didn't understand it. Can you help me? Have these kinds of conversation, rather than just pigeonholing people, saying, oh, they're Jehovah's Witness, they're like that, or, oh, they're Muslims, they're like this. All right, our next principle Understand the elasticity and fluidity of language. What are we saying? Are you saying what you think you're saying? Several years ago, David had an interaction with a man named Kifa Abdul Muhammad, who was reading a holy book. David walked up to him thinking he was reading a Bible. 
and said, hey, brother, how are you doing? I see you're reading a Bible. Kepha replied, no, man, I'm reading the Quran. They ended up having a really good conversation. In fact, they ended up having a relationship that lasted until David moved away from the area. David had learned enough about Muslims to know that when a Muslim says, are you a Christian? If he replies yes, listen to what you're actually saying. I'm a Roman Catholic who supports U.S. foreign policy. To Muslims, that's what a Christian is. So when Kepha said, are you a Christian? David says, I'm an Adventist. What do you think Kepha said? What's that? <laughs> this is an opportunity to say what David has learned to say to Muslims. I'm somebody who believes Messiah is returning. I pray, pray three times a day. I give not less than 10% of my income to charitable sources. That's important because Muslims give 2.5%. They get off easy, huh? <laughs> I don't defile my body with drugs or nicotine or alcohol. I don't defile my body with unclean foods such as pork. And I look forward to the judgment. Do you know what Kepha said? Something that David has heard many times. You're a better Muslim than I am. He said that because David has learned how to build bridges. One of his favorite things is building bridges with his Islamic friends. It works. Let's step out of our comfort zones the next time we're in a situation where it's appropriate. Here's another way to open a conversation with a Muslim. I just want to say to you, as somebody who lives here, I don't believe everything I hear in the media about Muslims. The lights come on. Often they thank David for saying that and start right in a conversation because Muslims are a people who feel that the rest of the world is looking upon them with huge suspicion, especially when they're in a country like America where they're in the minority. Conversation instantly. All right, number six. With some groups, and notice with some, this is not true with all, but with some groups, emphasizing your peculiarity will be a strength, not a hang-up. And here's an example. Joel, the genuine atheist, came to a series of meetings that David conducted. In their, in their conversation, David had the opportunity to say this to him. Joel, I am resonant with many of the intellectual motivations for atheism. David understands why people become atheists. And Joel's like, whoa, I can't believe a pastor is saying that to me. David's next line is this. I actually watched a debate several years ago between a Christian and an atheist, and I was pulling for the atheist. I watched the debate between Dinesh D'Souza and the late Christopher Hitchens. Christopher Hitchens got up front in this debate and raised three objections to the Christian faith. Number one, eternal burning hell. Number two, evolution working through all these many generations of death to get to this Edenic couple, Adam and Eve. And three, the record of the church in the Dark Ages. Adventists agree with all three. Did you realize you had so much in common with atheists? Adventists don't believe in eternal torment. We don't believe in evolution as God's means of creation. And we cannot defend the record of the church in the dark ages. One last rule or guideline. Don't in any way diminish or minimize the religious experience or genuineness of the other person. Kate was a Pentecostal minister. The first time Kate, David met Kate, he was speaking in her living room. There were literally 35 people packed in there, and David gave a message on why he believes the Bible is God's word, and also why he doesn't believe in eternal conscious torment in fires of hell. Kate ended up approaching him afterwards and said, Man, I just love what you're talking about. I loved your presentation and your message. We're going to be in America in a few months, and I would really love to connect with you. David said, sure, I would enjoy that. Kate and her husband end up camping with David and his family in beautiful Wyoming. One evening, 
Kate invited them to her campsite for dinner, and after they ate, Kate gave them an hour-long Bible study on the gift of tongues. She began, I love what I'm hearing from you. I've watched you on 3ABN, but you guys don't have all the truth. You are missing the truth about the baptism of the Spirit. David just listened and listened and listened. When she was finished, he said, Kate, first of all, thank you so much for that excellent Bible study. I really enjoyed it. Here's three points that we absolutely agree on. The gifts of the Spirit are absolutely for the ongoing ministry of the church. Notice that he started with points we agree on, that he could say yes, yes, and yes to. Then after he spent five or ten minutes talking about their agreement, he said, now here's where we might not see exactly alike. Notice all the qualifiers, might not exactly. He continued, with your permission, I'd like to take a little time to share with you why I believe what I believe. She responded, yes, by all means. He then gave her a shorter Bible study on passages of scripture that he finds really persuasive. As the Bible study came to a close, in a context of mutuality, he's been in her home, he's eaten her food, they've got a relationship. She puts her head in her hands, weeping, and says these words, Why has no one shared this with me until now? The next morning she came to David and said, I was up early this morning wrestling with my Jesus, wrestling with my Lord, and I am so thrilled with this newfound freedom that I have now in the teachings that you shared with me last night. So don't in any way diminish or minimize the religious experience or genuineness of the other person. They should never come away feeling that you've minimized their walk. If they're a Roman Catholic, If they're a Baptist, if they're a Muslim, you're dealing with a human being who is on a life journey just like you. Yes, their faith commitments aren't exactly like yours, but just remind yourself, I'm dealing with a human being who is made in the image of God himself, who is himself a son or daughter of God. And it'll help you relate to them in such a way that you don't feel this compulsion to minimize the nature of their religious experience. Jesus and Paul met people where they were, not where they should be. So when you engage with people, shake off any residual compulsion that you feel to set people straight. Meet them where they are, not where you are, and maybe not where you think they should be. Paul and Jesus spoke the language and entered into the world of those they were ministering to. There's no greater condescension of entering into another's world than Jesus, who became a man. Build bridges, not walls. Walls will take care of themselves. It boils down to one simple idea. The walls are already there. So you don't need to build more of them. Work on building bridges. It takes no skill to build a wall between yourself and another person religiously. It takes skill and some intelligence. It takes the Holy Spirit to build bridges where they don't easily exist. Today I've given you just a few tools so that you can go forward feeling more comfortable, that you don't have to get somebody all the way to a 10 in order to have experienced gospel success. A 2 to a 3, a 3 to a 4, or even a 4.5 to a 4.6 is gospel success. Give people an opportunity to have a positive interaction with someone who is a follower of Jesus. And that, in and of itself, is gospel success.